Hello, I'm Stephanie Ruff. And I'm Aviva Nabeski. We're the hosts of the Dressage Today podcast, where you can find us talking about anything and everything dressage related. Our conversations span the world of dressage from leading riders to local level dressage heroes. We're talking training advice, showing tips, and sharing stories to inspire your own dressage journey. So tune in, then tack up. Welcome back to the Dressage Today podcast, sponsored by Horse Week. Today, Aviva and I will be talking to a wonderful instructor who Aviva has had to her farm several times a year. Her name's Felicia Chandler. And Aviva, how did you discover her? Well, you know, several years ago, Robert Dover did a reality TV series about America's Next Dressage Star. And um, I had the opportunity to... to, um, to buy the the series on DVD and I watched it and Felicia was the winner. (laughs) And so I always remembered her name. Her name was always in the back of my head. And then during this year, when we've become a little bit more concerned, finally with creating diversity in the dressage community, the equestrian community, and um, some of the, the racial biases that, that, people have expressed and the things that have happened. Felicia wrote an article for one of the magazines and it was a very articulate article. It was very well thought out. It was very well written. But one of the things that she said that moved me more than anything was she talked about her very first dressage instructor, actually her very first riding instructor. And not only did she mention her very first riding instructor, but she mentioned her by name. And Felicia is a Grand Prix rider. She won Robert Dover's challenge. She was his assistant trainer for a year. She's a really big deal. And yet she gave credit to her very first ever riding instructor. And her very first riding instructor is a woman named Lydia Wainwright. And Lydia happens to be a friend of mine and has taken lessons with me in the past. And I just thought it took a very special person to be able to talk about Lydia in the same sentence that she talked about Robert (laughs) Dover. Yeah. So when I read the article last year, um, I said something, I think I might have posted something on Facebook and I acknowledged Lydia and Lydia got in touch with me and told me that she was working on getting Felicia up from Florida to do a clinic. And she was having some difficulty finding a facility and I volunteered mine. (laughs) <laughs> um, and so that became, that began our, our relationship. Felicia came up and taught, um, she's been up to me. I think it's two times now. Um, we try to work around weather because she doesn't like cold <laughs> and here in Maryland, sometimes it's cold. Plus she just had a baby a few months ago. So we were working around her pregnancy and her comfort levels. Um, but we have her coming back again in March, which is when it's starting to get warm here again. Um, she's an incredibly, um, patient, quiet, correct, kind, thoughtful instructor. Um, I watched obviously every single lesson that she taught, um, including having my own lessons with her. And I just feel like she's pretty darn terrific. And I'm really grateful to have her in my life. And what's even more fun is that Lydia rode in both of the clinics as well um, and getting to see their relationship. And I just always think it's so exciting to be able to see when people are able to allow other people to grow and develop. And I think it's a real tribute to Lydia that, you know, she was Felicia's first instructor and now she's taking lessons with Felicia. And I also think it's a real tribute to Felicia that She used to be Lydia's student, and now she is able to create a learning environment for Lydia without being in any way overbearing or pompous. So that's my friend Felicia, and I'm looking forward to our talking to her later on the podcast. Yes, me too. Definitely. I can't wait to get to know her better. Yeah. Um, But before we get to that, as I mentioned, when, when we opened here, this episode is sponsored by Horse Week, but I still wanted to go ahead and share a little bit more about what that's all about because it is a product of our parent company, the Equine Network. And so we've all probably heard of Shark Week. 
Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, this is Equine Network's own take on Shark Week, but instead it's called Horse Week. So it will run from October 3rd through October 9th on um, streaming online on horseweek.tv. And you'll be able to stream all sorts of content. It's all free of free of charge. There's going to be training videos covering all different disciplines, Western English, you know, there's dressage, jumping, all different kinds of things. And every night there's going to be a special feature. And some of those, uh, there's one on Pony Club. Mm -hmm. There's one on the Temple Grandin Equine Center, which is at the Colorado State University. Oh, I want to watch that one. Yes, definitely. Um, there are some pieces on like a, I'm not familiar with them, but a Western boot and saddle maker icon named ML Letty. Apparently they're not the biggest in the world, but there's like three or four generations of boot makers there. It's very wow. cool. Um, the Fort Worth Stockyards, IHSA, and, and even more. And I will tell you that I've, I've seen the trailers for all of them. And I watched the Pony Club piece because I, I wrote a little article about it. And I, I it was really good. I actually really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, people will have some time to go and check it out. So tell us again what, what we need to, to click on to get to this. So it it's... Uh, the website is horseweek.tv and you don't, and actually it's the HTTP colon slash slash. There's no WWW yeah. there. Okay. Um, and right now, if you go to it, you can watch all the trailers and it's, it's being updated kind of at, on a regular basis. They're getting the schedule together. And so there's going to be just a lot of different stuff and it should, you know, that, like I said, this is its first year. Uh, but we're already excited that how much it could potentially grow and take off and be an annual event for us. Ooh, super fun. Okay. Yes. Yes. So tune in October 3rd through October 9th. Got it. All, All right. right. So that's my, that's my PSA for the day. Um, <laughs> but now we have a, um, a question for you, Aviva. Yeah. And Today's question comes from Judy, and um, she says that most, most of us talk to our horses frequently, and many horses respond well to the voice. I'm, I'm guilty of having conversations with my horse constantly. So Me too. <laughs> yeah. But in the dressage ring, when you're showing, if your voice is heard, it is a two-point deduction. Yes. Her her question is why is that number one, and do you think that rule would ever change? Hmm. Well, Judy, I can definitively tell you that I have absolutely no clue why that's a rule. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that it is a rule. Um, I know that in Western dressage, they are permitted to use voice, oh. so they can cluck, oh. they can you know say to rut or really who um so i'm not sure why we classical dressage people are not allowed to cluck or use our voices and having said that i also can't answer if i think that will change because i don't know what the reasoning is <laughs> behind no use of voice um i i know that as a trainer when i'm working with riders with greener horses or greener riders and they're working on developing transition aids that I will frequently recommend that they use voice um, if their horses are well trained to the voice, for instance, on the lunge line, right. um, use their voice in conjunction with their aids so that yep. their horse understands the aid a little bit more clearly um, and then gradually phase out the voice so right. that it's simply the, the, the physical aid. Um, and so I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, it may have something to do with the fact that the aids are supposed to be invisible hmm. um, and that it should look like a communication that's happening, you know, with, with, with balance and rhythm and harmony and all of those kinds of things. And the use of voice would interfere with that. 
Um, but I don't know. It's an excellent question. I'll have to, I'll have to ask some people and see if I can figure yeah. out an answer to that one. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's been a rule for a long, long, long time too. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely not something recent, but I did not know that about Western dressage. So I've, yeah. I've learned something. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that they're lucky because how many of us cluck? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, you know, sometimes it's okay if you cluck down at the AN because the judge right. might not be able to hear you, but right. I mean, I've, I've been known to mutter under my breath when mm-hmm. I think I'm far enough away from the judge, <laughs> even if it's something just like good boy. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah. I have muttered too. I have, there have been tests that have gone very badly where I have done more than mutter. Um, But but I actually didn't get marked off for those. I think, you know, possibly because I was already being taken pity upon because, you know, (laughs) things were not going well. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh, and there were times, I don't know, I guess they don't take off for laughing because there are times when I've busted out laughing because, you know, because that's all you can do there, there are points yeah. when you just go, oh, this is just a disaster. So, yeah. so yeah, uh, I, I think, I think that when you're, when you're trying to help your horse with your voice, that's when the points come off. Right. If you just, right. you know, <laughs> although I'll, I have to tell you, I, I, I watched some riders who clear their throats or, or make noises that are, are maybe legitimate coughing or something right. like that. And and I think deep down they really have trained their horses to some weird noises. Oh, you know, we can train yeah. our horses to all kinds of stuff. You know, think yeah. about clipper training. That's a, yeah, that's a yeah. That, that's a that's a uh, that's a way around, possibly. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well maybe we can maybe we can investigate a little further to see if we can find out a little more of the uh, history. Although I I think you're onto something with the whole invisible AIDS thing because yeah, you know, yeah. but well, that was a very good question. Yeah. For those of you out there, if you have a question, you can email me at sruff at equine or reach out to us on social media. And when we return, we'll have our conversation with Felicia Chandler. Watch, learn, and be inspired. A horse lover's dream is streaming to a smart device near you this fall. Horse Week, brought to you by Bowringer Ingelheim, is coming October 3rd to 9th, 2021. Riders and horse lovers of every level and discipline will enjoy profiles of incredible equine athletes, storytelling that celebrates the horse-human bond, heartwarming tales of horse heroics, and advice from world-class trainers. Tune in from the barn, office, or the comfort of your couch. Equine Network is making it easy to watch the week-long celebration from any smart device. Visit horseweek.tv for more information. Felicia Chandler is the head trainer at Chandler Dressage, Inc. in Wellington, Florida. Originally from Kansas, Felicia started riding at age eight and developed her love for dressage as a young rider. One of her notable accomplishments so far is being the winner of Robert Dover's reality TV show, The Search for America's Next Dressage Star. Upon winning the show, Felicia also was presented with the opportunity to be Robert Dover's assistant trainer for a year. After that, she was an assistant trainer for Arlene Tooney Page and worked as a flat rider for show jumper Kent Farrington. Today, Felicia's goal for Chandler Dressage is to provide quality training, lessons, and dressage horses to the dressage world. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce you all to my friend Felicia Chandler. Um, Felicia has a training business in Florida and I was very lucky, which I told you about earlier in this broadcast, um, I was lucky to meet her some time ago and get to know her and her training methods. Um, Felicia is a little bit unique in the community in that she is a person of color. And I think that has um, 
change the way that she is seen and change the way that she has seen our community. And I'd like to get some of her insights about that. Um, also, for those of you who don't know, Felicia was in the, um, many years ago, there was a Robert Dover reality show about America's next um, dressage queen. That's what I call it. I know that's not really what it's called. And Felicia was the winner. And so she had the opportunity to spend a year as Robert Dover's assistant trainer. So we'd also like to learn a little bit about what it was like working with um, a multi-Olympian like that. So without any further ado, hello, Felicia. Thanks for joining us. And hello. tell us a little bit, how did you get interested in horses and riding? I know you grew up in Kansas. So how did you end up in dressage? Okay. So I began riding at the age of eight. Um, my grandmother decided to give in and let me start riding lessons. Um, and I started, like, um, honing in on dressage when I was about 15. Um, we took a trip to Young Riders, and I decided that the dressage portion was up my alley, and that's what I was going to um, work towards. And um, and that's when my love of dressage started to really, um, you know, form. Who were your mentors or the people who most influenced you as you started on your dressage journey? Um, let's see. So my mentors, you know, as you know, I always mention, I always mention my first instructor, Lydia Wayne White, because she's the one who um, started me out with my beginner lessons and, you know, um, really helped me gain my confidence and understanding um, of, you know, proper riding, should I say. And then, um, of course, you know, uh, growing up at that point in time, Robert Dover was, you know, on basically every dressage Olympic team that I, you know, saw. And so, like, I just thought that he was, the, the best ever, and that's who I, you know, idol, idolized growing up. And how did you end up applying and then getting accepted to um, his search for America's Next Dressage star? Um, I actually um, saw an article he had put in the magazine saying that he was going to take two riders and have them come to his farm um, for a month of free training. And like, who would not jump on that opportunity? And so I sent in my video to apply for that. And from there, you know, um, I kept being updated on how the show was progressing and it was going to, you know, then be, you know, more than two riders. And then it was going to be, put in a position of where it would be a idol meet apprentice type thing. And then from there, you know, it came about that it's going to be filmed and be put on TV. So, um, you know, anyone who knows me from, you know, a young kid knows that I was very, very shy as a child. And, um, and so I don't know, had it been presented in the beginning about being on TV that I would have ever applied. <laughs> so, I guess, you know, it was meant to be the way that it came about um, because I don't know that I would have, you know, applied otherwise. What was the most exciting or interesting part about the program? What, what stays with you the most for that experience? You know, it was a very stressful time for me because, like I said, I was super shy. Um, and, um, and so I guess the, the, the final day of, you know, showing, um, you know, to me that made it all worth it because that is, there's one thing that anyone knows I love to do. I love the horse show. So <laughs> I was like, 
in my element. It was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> this is like this. I know how to do. Like, you put me in a shower, I'm happy, I'm ready to go. You know? So, um, I think, um, you know, that's where, you know, um, they finally got to see that, you know, that's, I was in my element, you know, in that moment. What can you tell us about the horse that you brought with you to Robert? Oh, neon. <laughs> um, you know what? That was not my horse. I don't know that people know that. My horse was, I had a gray trichaner named Marcel. And that horse I owed the entire world to. He made every single one of my dreams that I decided and thought up in my head of doing. That horse made it come true. And I bought that horse, um, like, as a training level horse. And I had to bring it along up to the upper levels because we could not afford, you know, for me to have a fancy warm blood. But I had these big dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he was my first horse that I trained for the FBI level. And um, I had taken a clinic and trying to get in preparation to go on the TV show. And... The clinician had me turn one too many pirouettes and we strained a suspensory. Aww. So oh my God. I, um, I actually hauled him down. We thought, you know, he would be ready to go by the time we got down there. And I actually hauled him, you know, down to Florida. But um, then the show was put on hold for a bit because of the hurricane that came <laughs> through. And, um, and then as I, you know, worked him down here, I realized that he was not a hundred percent and, you know, he owed me nothing. Yeah. And so I actually called Robert and said, I would find a horse. You have time, you know, I really want you to participate, find a horse, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I said, okay. And so then the third began for me to find a horse to, to use in the show and um it was diane rodwich who put me in contact with carol grant and i didn't know at the time that carol grant had actually trained robert before <laughs> and i um went to try two horses that are placed one was a made grand prix horse the other one was Neon, and he had only competed to fourth level. And, you know, I was talking to Carol about it, and it was like, well, you know, it's kind of hard. Like, yeah, you want to take the Grand Prix horse, because who doesn't want to ride a <laughs> on the Grand Prix horse? But then they let you know, also, you know, even once you are kicked off the show, you still get to stay and train with Robert. So you still got your lessons daily um, behind the scenes. So it wasn't like you, you know, got kicked off and then you weren't, you know, like right. you were gone. You know, you still, um, you weren't on the TV show anymore, but you were still there, you know, getting to ride your horse and, and do lessons. And it was like, what's the better um, deal for you? For you to go around and learn how to push buttons on a made horse, or to actually get to train a horse with Robert Dover, you know? And so I picked Neon, who was the fourth level horse, and uh, took him to the show because, in my mind, I thought I would be going home the first week anyway. So, you know, <laughs> it was like, my as well get the most of the experience, you know? <laughs> So one of the things that you did also was that you um, worked with Kent Farrington riding his jumpers. So can you tell us a little about what that was like and how maybe that influenced your dressage training? Um, you know, that's amazing. The jumpers are a whole other, <laughs> you know, type of animal. <laughs> um, and I, you know... Even though it wasn't in my lane, it was still a great learning experience. Right. And it's great to, you know, um, 
to figure out ways how to get these horses to perform at their best. Um, and I had, you know, a lot of fun, you know, being a part of that team and getting to see, you know, some of the horses that I once rode and flatted, um, come along and become, you know, great, you know, contenders for Kent. And that's been, you know, really cool to see. I bet. Um, so as Aviva mentioned earlier, and since this is a, a podcast and we're not um, on video, you are a person of color. And so could mm-hmm. you could you talk to us a little bit about if that's affected your business as a professional and if it has changed from when you got started towards, you know, versus where you're at now? Yeah, um, I am uh, African American. Um, and that, um, in the beginning with trying to build my business, yes, it was hard. You know, a lot of people look at you and they figure you could not, you know, have the experience, um, with the horses, you know, as well as your counterpart because the color of your skin, you know, you weren't, you know, born around the horses or, you know, been in the barn or, you know, done this or done that. And, um, and I feel like it's a lot different now, Yeah. you know, um, it's more accepting, it's more, you know, it's not, um, it's not, people, you know, don't doubt you as much because the color of your skin, um, nowadays, I guess. Well, and I shouldn't say now it's more since the, this whole equality movement has taken place. Yeah. That is, you know, what's happened, that people are being held accountable for their words and their actions. And, um, and I feel like, you know, now is more um, inclusive than what it has been. Um, in some ways, I feel it's uh, because a lot of people have been made aware, you know, mm-hmm. of, you know, the difference, the differences and in, in other ways, it's, you know, some people are just scared to, to, uh, to, to make a mistake, you know, they don't want to, um, how do I put it? <laughs> um, you know, they don't want to be the odd one out pretty much, you know, so they're a bit more accepting. Right. Um, and people aren't as vocal about, you know, um, you know, how they may truly feel, you know, about a person of color, you know, being a trainer or, you know, at the show ring or things like that, you know? Right. Yeah. Do you think that there are other biases in in equestrian sports related to things like um, gender or financial status or religion, or is it is it a pretty clear cut bias for for skin color? No, it's definitely a bias when it comes to as far as like financial status. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. whole you know another ball game. You know, um, yeah. and that even goes in between. And when you talk about people of color and horses, you know, it's like yes, people of color, but even within that, then the financial status comes along. You know, to separate even the people of color. You know, so yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's um it's 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 different. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find it different riding for Kent? as an African-American woman than you did riding as a dressage person? Was there a difference in the disciplines? Well, it was different because when I was a kid, she already had another Mm. black rider there, another black female rider there. So I wasn't the only one. Wow. And, And so, and then he also was the trainer to another black rider, you know? So it wasn't as if, you know, going you know, to Kent and I walk into a barn and I'm the 
only black, you know? Like, where yeah. when I worked for Robert, I, you know, I was the only one, you know? So, yeah. um, you know, yeah, it was, it was different. Um, but not as, you know, um, of course, being in uh, Ken's barn was awesome. And, you know, they're very, like, they're not, um, I never had anything as far as, like, race or anything, you know, and dealing with being at Kent, you know, barn. And, um, but it's not in dressage, it's, it's just different, you know, because I don't, I feel like even if my skin had been a different color, my financial status mm. would have still had me at the same place, you know, that I was, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people, you know, down here, you just turn their nose up, if you, you know, if you're not in a certain, you know, uh, status. Yeah. But even that has become so much better, you know? Well, we're like we're finally has, opening um, up, huh? <laughs> Yeah, like, I feel like that has become so much better with um, the financial status because we have better, uh, uh, we are able to access better forces. And um, so then, like, we may not, necessarily have the money to go buy the four hundred thousand dollar course but we can buy something less and make it you right. know into a four hundred thousand dollar horse. Yeah. And so um I feel like it's you know it's it's more it's becoming a bit more inclusive in certain ways. Right. You know? So then what do you think we can do to encourage, I mean, it's great that things are getting better, but what do you think we can do to encourage more diversity in dressage? I don't have like the, you know, the, the complete answer, you know, but I feel like um, it's just the complete answer is like dressage for kids where there are there are horses that are available to give people an opportunity they might not otherwise have exactly but you know yeah. you go like i've not looked not gone to dressage for kids every year you know i've not been involved with it and i you know i was never invited to be involved <laughs> in the program um and so you know I don't know, if, but I know that from what I have seen and from, you know, when they post pictures and things like that, I've not seen really any young people of color involved in those programs. I don't know for what reason, you know, that has been the way that it has been, you know, but that is something that I would love to change, whether it's, you know, helping dressage for kids, you know, in that aspect or starting another program that, you know, we're able to, you know, um, get more kids of color involved into the sport. You know, I get contact and I mentor, um, you know, quite, well, I feel like it's quite a few <laughs> young <laughs> men of color, you know, in the industry. You know, and I love it, and but it's heartbreaking at times too to see their struggle. Yeah. You know, to see them when they work for, you know, um, individuals, and the individuals don't understand. 
you know, where they're coming from, you know, right. there's so many times, like, they have to go work, and they're working, like, in rural places, you know, <laughs> but their employers and stuff aren't thinking about, hmm, I have a young man of color out here in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there yeah. needs to be another person who looks like him, you know, for, you know, months and months, you know, and it's like, they don't, like, think of what effect that has on that person, you know, um, or, you know, that he's out there in the middle of nowhere and, like, safety, you know, that's what I, I get fearful of, you know, when I hear there, like, I worry about, you know, their safety, you know, yeah. don't go out with such an adult of it, you know, so, um, yeah. you know, uh, I don't know. Well, it's definitely a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> but isn't everything? Yes. You know? Yeah. You know, and I feel we have like a long we're way to go. forward and we're taking the steps forward and we're having these conversations and, um, you know, that hopefully we'll, we'll get somewhere, right. you know, with it. And, you know, you hear of the different scholarships and things that are happening for our um, writers that are people of color, especially the young ones. And, you know, I love, like, hearing, like, about that, you know? Yeah. And, like, even, like, when um, one of my guys saw that, you know, there was a scholarship being offered, you know, and it was, like, for your goals as a writer and, you know, or programs or this, that, and the other. And he was like, you should apply, you know, because, I want you to apply and then be able to, you know, teach me, you know, and bring, you know, some of us there, you know, and for you to be able to, you know, teach us and we come and train with you. Like, and so, you know, that makes me feel good, you know, sure. but, um, you know, that they, they, they want, you know, to, you know, have me help them, you know. Yeah. Well, they see you as a role model. They yeah. see you as someone who has managed to yeah. overcome no the bias and be successful. And, you know, it was your initial passion that, that got you there because without that passion, I can only imagine the roadblocks that stood in your way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it, you know, has to be about at the end of the day. It's your love of the horses. And that's basically, you know, what, what carried me through, you know, my love of the horses. And even in times when I would feel as though, you know, this is too much, you know, <laughs> like it's overwhelming, you know, this sucks, you know, people suck, <laughs> you know, it was, yeah. you know, the horses would, you know, be there. And on top of that, my grandmother, anyone who knows me knows my grandmother raised me and we're very close. And, you know, you know, at times when I could be like, okay, let's just, hang up you know the boots and go on about life you know she wouldn't let me do that because she knew how much I loved it you yeah. know how much you know joy and how hard I had worked over the years to get to where I was and um you know and she would always say to me in those moments okay I know you're tired but do it for the next little black girl that comes along you know do it for the next one, you know, you're, you're tired. And so, you know, don't do it for you, do it for her, you know? And so that's like, sometimes that is what kept me going, you know, and that's, you know, also that keeps you in line as far as like your behavior and, you know, how you carry yourself, you know, she right. would let me know, like, you have to be, you know, better you have to be you know um carry yourself in a way because if you don't then they are you know will assume that all little black girls act like this and you may you know cut out the opportunity for the next little black girl to come along it's you a know? lot of pressure for a little kid huh yeah. <laughs> a big a big you know a big thing to carry, you know, yeah, as yeah. girl. But you know, um, 
I'm I'm happy that you know I had the opportunity to do so, and that it you know was something that I could lean on to keep me going. Well, from talking to you over the time that I've known you and reading the things that you've written, um, your your grandmother sounds like a truly, truly remarkable woman. Um, and you were you were lucky to have had her to to shine a light for you. But she also, I know, is so incredibly proud of the way that you carry yourself and the way that you present yourself. Um, and I, I, I think she's honored that, that you're her, her grandchild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. You know, I feel, you know, the same admiration for her, you know, you know, to have this woman that lived through so, so much, you know, when you think of it, like she, you know, got to meet her great grandparents and grandparents, you know, those are people that, you know, were involved, you know, with slavery and then coming into, like, her up to live through segregation and desegregation and, you know, all the way, you know, through all of these years and all of these moments, you know, mm-hmm. in our country, good and bad, you know, and so, um, like, to grow up with someone who has that range, right. you know, and live through that much. You know, there's a lot of knowledge that, you know, comes out of those with. <laughs> what words of wisdom do you have then for some of the young up and coming riders, regardless of, you know, whoever they are? Yeah. Regardless of, you know, for me, I love to influence, you know, anyone and everyone, regardless of their, you know, whether they're people of color or not, right. whether they're old, young, you know, whether they're amateur or pro, like, to me, I, you know, um, I, I just, you know, I try and do what I can to help whoever I can. And I tell those kids that, you know, just to keep going, mm-hmm. you know, just keep going, keep trying, one foot in front of the other, you know, don't give up, you know, chase your dreams. You know, I tell, you know, so many, you know, young people that, you know, I, you know, I'm in contact with and I just tell them just, you know, go for it, you know, right? go for it. And my last question is one that we like to ask everyone just to get their perspective and what, and so to you, what do you think makes a good horse person? I believe a good horse person is a person that has patience and empathy, you know, um, you know, when you work with your horses, it should be a conversation. Um, and you know, sometimes in a conversation, someone may say something that you don't want to hear, but <laughs> you gotta have your, your ears open and be receptive, you know, um, and be able to keep those lines of communication open. So I feel like a good horse person um, is going to keep those lines of communication open with their horses, and they're always going to put their horses first. Well, that's and and it sounds like you have certainly done that in your in your time thus far as a pro- professional. So. Um, It's been an absolute pleasure to get to know you a little bit. And I want to thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about your perspective and your take and your, your um, history thus far in the, in the dressage world. And um, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Dressage Today podcast. If you've missed any episodes or to subscribe, go to Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Learn more and read in-depth training articles at dressagetoday.com, or you can visit our subscription video site, ondemand.dressagetoday.com. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. 
Happy writing, and we'll see you at X. The Dressage Today podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of Equine Network, LLC. 